Hey everybody out there, it's Chris, it's the Mad Respect, back again, sooner than I even anticipated because Discount Code Book Service held true to their word and had this box uh, delivered to me late last night, uh, Friday night, uh, pretty quick, uh, less, less than five days door to door, uh, uh, every once in a while. Uh, Discount Comic Service uh, takes care of that, and I think it was maybe the end of January, sometime in February, I did get two uh, two boxes in, in a single week, uh, and it happened again this time, so uh, I usually start my videos with reviews of some things I've read from uh, the previous box, but I only got through about two-thirds of it, but I will discuss what I did read, and also in this video, uh, I'm wearing... Uh, the uh, Sink Cutthroat t-shirt that I got as part of uh, the Kickstarter and the physical uh, item here of uh, Sink number 11 Cutthroat arrived from Comics Tribe also this week. So we'll open that up. Excited about that. So let's start out with the reviews. Let's go through the free comic book day uh, ones that I read. Uh, this is the Animal Castle free comic book day. Uh, yeah, this free volume two. Uh, this is uh, straight up just a uh, reprint of issue one of volume one of Animal Castle, and then about eight pages from Animal Castle volume two, number one, reprinted. So no new material in here. Uh, new number one is Free Comic Book Day Fish Flies from Image Comics and Jeff Lemire doing the story and art. Um, this was excellent, uh, and I really do hope that even though uh, all issues of uh, fish flies are being solicited as oversized, I'm hoping that this 15-page uh, story uh, in here is exclusive to the free comic book day issue, uh, and that uh, issue one of fish flies uh, kicks off immediately following this. Uh, basically, uh, you meet about six to seven unnamed characters, uh, a group of four teenage boys, uh, out after dark with uh, money they've gotten from their parents during the summer to walk to the 7-Eleven and get themselves some uh, uh, popsicles and junk food. Uh, and then when they get to the parking lot at the 7-Eleven, uh, uh, it's just an ocean of dead husks of these fish fly bugs uh, through the entire parking lot, and when you step on them, they squish and explode. So three of the four kids are like, this is gross, we can't even go in the store now, this is a waste of our time coming here. And the fourth one's like, uh, uh, I'll go in, I'll, I'll go in and just give us, give, give me all the money you have and we'll pull it all together and I'll go and I'll buy everything for all of us. Uh, and they're like, uh, he's like, no, you're, you're too wussy, you're not gonna do it. And he's like, uh, I'll do it, but I want your I want your twenty dollars, and then he's like, oh, "I'll give you the twenty dollars if you walk over these bugs uh, barefoot." So the fourth kid uh, takes the bet and takes off his shoes, and spends uh, the remainder of the issue walking across this parking lot and squishing all the dead fish flies, and then you see uh, a flash back as soon as the kid steps on the first fish fly, and you hear the crack. You see uh, a gunman awaken uh, with a gut shot. He's bleeding from the gut, and uh, the crack has awoken him, and then you see him get up, and he's kind of disoriented, and then you see him walk. Uh, he's buried in the dead fish flies, but as he stands up, there are several that are still alive, and they start to attach themselves to his body, and then it cuts uh, again back into time to where the kid has just arrived at the door of the mini mart, and he's yelling to their kids, hey, I made it, I made it, the $20 is mine. And then he walks in and he sees uh, the clerk of the store dead on the floor, covered with uh, uh, living uh, fish flies. And behind the counter is the man you saw awaken from the pile of fish flies in the flash forward. Uh, and he's got the gun and he's like, what are you doing here? What the fuck are you doing here? And uh, the boy's like, I just want a popsicle. And then you see, blam, at the bottom of the page. And it cuts again forward to the man, he's running through the through a field uh, towards a barn and the fish flies are attaching to themselves to him. 
And by the time he gets inside of the door of the barn, he's completely engulfed in them. And you see him just thump to the ground. And then on the last three pages, you see this little boy girl. I'm not sure. Uh, you don't, no dialogue or anything. Just her walking through, picking up husks. So like, these are cool. And then when she gets to the barn, she gets in there and she sees the dead body of the robber. So, very cool. I'm looking forward to seeing where this story goes for sure, as usual with Jeff Lemire. And then we have the Spider-Man and Venom free comic book day issue. Uh, the Spider-Man story is uh, Spider-Man uh, taking down a rogue uh, escaped gorilla on the streets of New York. Uh, and after he takes it down, uh, some animal rights people show up out of nowhere saying, hey, you didn't have to punch that gorilla. It's an animal, you know, it's just a dumb animal. And he's like, well... It looked, he seemed pretty smart to me, you know? And then after he uh, he hears the sirens and the people are like, don't you go, we want you to talk to the police. And like, Peter's like, tell him it's the one, the Spider-Man from Brooklyn, which seems kind of out of character for Peter. But maybe he's just being sarcastic. He doesn't really mean to pin it on Miles. But, uh, and then after Peter flies away, it cuts to Craven showing up because uh, Peter Parker used the, uh, he has these little, uh, jelly egg things that he throws from his glider that uh splat and turn into a uh, webbing uh and then when he's off of his glider it turns into like a little drone sort of thing and that disperses all these splat things so it shows craven show up with uh one of the little jelly balls and then you see dr octopus's tentacle come and take it and he's like now i have everything i need for my plan thank you craven and it says to be continued, and I believe that is the story immediately following our current uh, Who Dies in issue 26 uh, uh, storyline. When I know it was leaked that it was Kamala Khan who's going to die in issue 26 of Amazing Spider-Man, but I'm, I'm almost kind of hoping that they deliberately leaked it online to be Kamala Khan so that everybody pivots to, oh, we're just thinking it's Kamala Khan now, and then everyone's going to get their 26 in hand, and when they read it, then the big shock comes, we'll find out who, who really dies. But if it's just Kamala Khan, then I can live with that too. All right, here is Free Comic Book Day Uncanny Avengers, number one. Uh, this has uh, two stories by Jerry Duggan. The first one's a quick uh, X-Men story where... Uh, this new Captain Kokoa character, he is a human sent in by Orcus to uh, somehow he's able to infiltrate the Hellfire Gala uh, where he's confronted by Cyclops and they and they fight each other and the human's like, uh, I had this one from the beginning because since I'm a human, you've already discounted me as less because that's what all you mutants are now. Humans are less than you. So... Uh, Cyclops turns around because he had uh, shot him with the beam and thought, oh, he's gone, he's done because he's human. But obviously this guy has some sort of enhancements on top of being human because he's uh, dressed into the Captain Krakoa costume. And uh, uh, then he uh, sees the whip Cyclops' ass and then he's dragging Cyclops' unconscious body. He's like, do you want to die in the fire or uh, be thrown off the building? And Cyclops is unconscious, so the guy's like, I guess it's dealer's choice, uh, off the building, throw Cyclops off the building. And then at the beginning of the story, you see, uh, Mystique and Rogue discussing that someone has infiltrated the party. Uh, and they're like, oh, we have to, we got to tell Rogue. And Mystique's like, well, Rogue, uh, tore off out of here already. And so the second part of the story is an uncanny Avengers, who's both X-Men, Iron Man, and uncanny Avengers are all going to be written by Jerry Duggan as of, uh, as of August, uh, so it basically has uh, Captain America, and he's busting up, uh, I think it might be AIM, or it might just be a bunch of Orcus, oh yeah, he's uh, there's a bunch of Orc, they're Orcus people, they're Orcus people in armor, and they're like causing some kind of unrest on the street, so Captain America goes and starts to uh, take them on, and then he gets thrown into the ocean, and under the ocean he's a uh, getting his ass whipped by a bunch of other orcs people. And then you see Rogue fly in and save him. And she's like, oh, I, I, I knew these jokers were down here. Uh, I came to save you. Uh, 
And so that kind of kicks off the Uncanny Avengers part of the story. So interesting. I may uh, check out the first arc of Uncanny Avengers when it comes out. Because I'm already reading Dugan's uh, Invincible Iron Man. And as of now, I'm reading Dugan's uh, X-Men because it will cross over uh, tangentially with Iron Man because uh, the Felong character we're working for Orcus has bought out Stark Unlimited and is building Stark Sentinels with the uh, Stark tech and Iron Man is uh, looking to uh, kick that in the bud so he's teamed up with uh, uh, Emma Frost and, and Iron Man and then this issue uh, deals uh, has about three quarters of it is about uh, uh, Orcus uh, Orcus has a a uh, alternate of Mr. Sinister working for them, uh, and also, uh, MODOK is working with, uh, Orcus, so, uh, they've tainted some of the Krakoan, uh, health pills that they've, that in order to be free on Krakoa way back at the beginning of Passive X Powers of Ten, that was part of the deal, like, you leave us alone on the island and we will give you cure for cancer pills, cure for mental illness pills, uh, cure for Alzheimer's pills. So, Because Mr. Sinister founded Krakoa with Mora and Xavier, this whole time he's been setting up the Sins of Sinister thing where he's been replacing members of the council with, them, with uh, clones of himself. And I haven't read Sins of Sinister, but obviously one of these guys working for Orcus is the uh, spade version of Mr. Sinister, and they have been corrupting the meds. So now they have remote control operated meds. Some, uh, an unknown amount of the meds that they have given to the humans, uh, they've, they can press a remote control and that will make the uh, user of the, of the Krakoan medicine commit suicide basically. So that was mainly the main part of this issue. Pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't really... The next issue has the Stark Sentinels on the cover, so I thought I got this issue because I thought it might have more to do with what's going on in Iron Man, but it's more... Uh, it's more uh, just what Orcus is doing in general, and I had to open up because there was a second part of the story was there's a... There's like a tent run by Orcus just downtown where mutants can go in, because they're claiming they have the genome, mutant genome shutoff uh, ability if you, if you sign up and sign papers and go into these tents and within the city. Uh, and one of the more uh, deformed looking mutants is at the door and he's like, oh, I'll check it out. So he goes inside and all of a sudden there's all these weird looking, mech looking things. And uh, he's like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm changing my mind. And then they start dragging him in to do something to him. And all of a sudden Cyclops, uh, forged and i can't remember who else they come in and they're like uh, i think he said he wanted to leave so uh we're gonna we're gonna take him out of here and then one of the mechs uh starts just whipping everybody's ass and then forge uh of has all his special stuff so he uh stops that from happening uh but then after they defeat the mech they realize that inside of it is uh a wolverine skeleton and then you find out that Every time Wolverine has died and been uh, resurrection protocol, uh, the dead bodies rot, but the skeleton remains. And Orcus has been collecting all these uh, uh, animadium skeletons, complete with claws, and making uh, robot mechs out of them. So that was very interesting. And first up from these comics is X Men Red number eleven. Uh, this one is, again, a Storm featured issue, as was Mortal x -Men. This one was more entertaining for me. This is Rogue at the start. I mean, not Rogue. Uh, Storm at the start. She's on a date uh, with uh, some human who lives on Arako, who is like a counselor for uh, Iraqi children who lost their parents when they died in the Judgment Day arc. So, and she... I don't know when she met him. Uh, it wasn't in one through ten. I don't know. 
know when she met him at some point during Judgment Day and she has him up there on Mars uh, as a uh, counselor for these children. And so she decides to go on a date with him and then she's interrupted in the middle of the date by Xavier who's demanding to know what Magneto's last words were when he died. And uh, Storm's like, I'm not going to tell you that, but I will tell you that his last words were uh, about you. And it wasn't that he was worried that you were corrupted by Sinister. He was worried that you are just you and you're just going to fuck everything up. And she's like, and then, uh, though I won't tell you what his last words were, I now realize that they were true and I don't want you to use the, uh, the, uh, uh what do you call it, the, the gateway onto Mars anymore. You're not welcome on Mars anymore. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if this takes place, uh, like immediately following a mortal X-Men or immediately before mortal X-Men, but, uh, yeah. They're both around the same time, and basically, uh, Xavier is now, like, persona non grata to Storm. Here's Ghost Rider number 14. This is the, uh, Annie Huckley Taiguki, uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders month variant. Uh, the main story is, uh, uh, Johnny Blaze and Talia Warroad have, uh, at the end, they've just found where, uh, Danny Ketch has been being held uh held and experimented on by these scientists uh and you find out uh all the different places they've sent the possessed uh danny catch ghost rider uh he's killing vampires he's killing uh, mutants he's killing whatever there's basically governmental people who are funding the scientific research but in return for that they want this lady to send out uh danny catch uh and clean up all these problems. So, and at the end, uh, Johnny and Talia are breaking into the facility. So she, she's like, uh, turn, uh, turn Danny Ketch on high because what she wants the Ghost Rider for is she wants to uh, power her own hell mech to jump into mech herself and go to hell and retrieve the soul of her brother who was possessed by a demon and died. Uh, as a teenager, so she wants to save her brother, and she's 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 unconcerned if Danny dies from uh, all this. Uh, they're basically sucking the the Ghost Rider out of uh, Danny, but it's fatal, and they're not telling him that it's fatal. But she just wants the Ghost Rider power to uh, power to Mac to go to hell to save her brother. So uh, definitely uh, leads into that. And then there's a backup story where Taiguki meets Johnny Blaze, and there's some uh, some villain that Taiguki uh, fought alive uh, at some point, but died. Now his ghost is uh, went from South Korea to because he was born in the U.S. The ghost reappeared in the U.S. and is murdering people, and Taiguki and the ghost have to take him down. So I'm not sure what the point of that backup story was. We'll just have Taiguki, I guess. Here's uh, Sandman, Nightmare Country, The Glass House, uh, issue number two. Uh, this has a guest art by Patricio Del Peche, who is by James Tenney in the fourth. Uh, this one's pretty cool. The main character from the first uh, arc is, uh, I guess he's like part of a production company that's making a film about uh, the, the main character from volume one, uh, Madison, is that her name? I just gotta look. One second. Yeah, Madison Flynn. Madison Flynn from the first volume. Uh, she was like mortally wounded by uh, the billionaire guy who had abducted her. And then uh, Mr. Agony, Mr. Ecstasy were there and all that. And then uh, Dream came and saved her uh, essence and has uh, put her into a cat. And her main duty is uh, she is, uh, Sandman is letting uh, Corinthian uh, navigate the waking world, but he cannot kill anybody or hurt anybody unless under direct orders from Madison, who's in cat form. So 
But, uh, so the main character is this guy in a production company who's about to create a film uh, about Madison. But the production company is run, I believe, by Lucifer. Uh, he, they show him, and he's up in the main top floor of a, of a penthouse. And he has the, like, the Todd Klein type of, like, uh, like, Loki type of, uh, word balloon lettering. Uh, not Loki, but, like, uh, yeah, like, Norse type of, if you know what the Norse, uh, font looks like in a comic book, that's how he speaks. And then, uh, he sends all of the people who, uh, all the people he likes best who work for him down below, he'll take to a to a special club in the city, which is actually a gateway directly to hell. And at the start of the issue, uh, our main character is dating uh, this dead woman who's like basically a stripper slash like concierge uh, who you meet there. And uh, he's fallen in love with her. He just wants, she can just lay there and talk with her all night. Uh, and she's like, well, you know, this is hell, you know, you should probably, he's like, I don't care that it's hell. It's, I'm glad I finally met someone that I'm into. And at the end, Corinthian leaves uh, Madison as a cat in his apartment. He shows up at the apartment, and she's like, hey, what's up? Because she can talk as a cat. And he's like, what the hell? She's like, yeah, I'm Madison Flynn. Uh, we need to talk. And then Corinthian finds the club and enters hell. And then you see a disembodied voice speaking with him like, oh, you're, you're, you're back on the waking world, but you're on Dream's leash. Uh, uh, can you do a little side work for me? And then... Uh, back when he was originally in the waking world, he had a relationship with a young man in a club, uh, but then, of course, killed him and ate his eyes. Uh, that's what you presume, because when he meets him, they show a flashback where he meets him, and he's like, he's like, uh, never close your eyes, you have, you have beautiful eyes. You know, he's he's into his eyes, because currently has the mouth for eyes. Uh, so... The disembodied voice says, if you can do some side jobs for me, you can come here anytime you want and be with your if your old lover. So this is an interesting second arc, totally different from the first arc, aside from the fact that the Corinthian is still in it and then Madison is now in cat form. Here is Amazing Spider-Man 25 by uh, Zeb Wells. This has uh, a flashback story of everything Mary Jane had done in the time Peter was has been looking for her through issues 23 and 24, or not, I mean, trying to uh, create the tech to return to her. Uh, it shows everything she's done, and that story is drawn by Carrie Andrews. And then it, uh, that is in the uh, day and a half it took Peter to steal and betray all these heroes to create the tech to warp back to, uh, to Mary Jane. Uh, it had been four years for Mary Jane. And you find out that the children are not biological children. They're just two scared lost children that her and Paul found uh, in this wasteland. And she's like, I'm not leaving these kids. And Paul's like, well, I won't leave them either. And then it flashes forward at the end. And it has like a pretty much the same four pages as the end of issue 24. Basically reprinted in here where he appears, defeats uh, defeats the, the god, the god mathematician. And then... He tries to, like, give her a hug, and she's like, no, things have changed. And she's like, this is my family. That was all in 24. But then it has another eight or nine pages by John Romero Jr., where uh, basically he has a way, and they all work back to uh, regular, uh, what do you, you call it? They work back to the regular timeline, and something happened to Paul because he's uh, been hospitalized, and they show Peter and Mary Jane. Uh, in the hospital in the waiting room and she's like yeah I was in there for four years and a lot of things have changed and uh, I'm with uh, these kids and I'm with Paul and he's like he's like but when we were last together we were walking through the forest and you said we were going to be together and and I was a mess but you loved me as that mess and she's like I'm not leaving him Peter and so he leaves he's kind of steamed about it so he leaves and then he's immediately confronted by the Fantastic Four and Captain America and he's like and Fantastic Four's like, can we have our uh, nuclear device -y thing back that you ripped off? And he's like, no, I used it, and it's gone, but Mary Jane's safe, so so that's it. And then Human Torch is like, no, no, that's not it. We're going we're gonna to get this on. So they start uh, having physical claps, and then Captain America shows up and goes, no, no, just leave him alone. He, he, he's made his bed. 
So then Peter goes off, and then you see like a little uh, montage of a few weeks after Paul gets out. You see Peter is like smacking Paul in the face, so he's not really into the fact that Mary Jane is with him. And then uh, I'm not sure exactly what happens at the very end. I'm not done with my video. What's up, babe? I'm making my video. So yeah, just they have that. Uh, they have those flashbacks, uh, or those uh, that montage with Peter uh, burning that bridge with Paul and her, and then they show that the the mathematician god is not dead, but uh, he still wants uh, Mary Jane to uh, be sacrificed so that uh, the uh, god can be reborn in his body. So. So we'll see what happens in 26. That's coming out next week, I believe, on uh, 31st. And here's Star Wars The High Republic, the penultimate issue. Uh, this is The Leveler Unleashed. Uh, the uh, Path of the Open Hand actually has a remote control for the leveler that can turn it on and off. Uh, and basically, every time the Jedi shows up, they're turning it on. And it eats the uh, cat Jedi Master character who appeared... Uh, is the protector of the statue out in the sand, the cold sands of Jeddah. Uh, so he's definitely eaten and turned into a husk uh, in the first half of this. And then uh, Tay Sarek, he finds uh, another uh, relic there while they're in hiding, watching this happen. And it's a relic, a dark side relic, and you put it on and uh, it gives you uh, like power blasts out of your hand. And then... He's like, well, I'm a big badass. He's going to go, and he goes and tries to take on the path of the open hand, but the leveler makes short work of him, and he's quote-unquote dead. And so uh, the main uh, Jedi Master in here, the male Jedi Master, he uh, they start to sick the leveler on him, and he's like, he's like, uh, I am the Jedi, and... The light is a life. I am the Jedi, and the light is a life. And then he looks down and sees the uh, Sith Force uh, artifact that Tay had been using, and he looks down, puts it on his hand, and goes, uh, "The light is lying. Fuck the light." So he's gonna go take on the Leveler with this uh, dark side uh, relic on him. So, uh, and then it says, "To be concluded, uh, uh, Jedi gone bad or something." So that was cool. And here we'll finish off with number ones. Uh, we have Mono Myth number one from Mad Cave Studios by David Hazan and Cecilia Lovalvo. Uh, this is really good. Uh, the few reviews I read of, I saw of it, uh, mixed. Some people are really into uh, David's work, uh, especially Nottingham. Uh, this is, it's just all uh, a slow introduction to the characters uh, and drops them into the situation basically. Uh, the last living uh, magician who looks pretty much like Merlin in some sense. He realizes he's about to die, so he has a uh, a spell he can cast from where he's at, and it will find anyone with the ma magician blood, uh, and it will summon them to this castle, and then they can, uh, uh, from there, uh, they will start to be trained to uh, take over the the magician rule, and unknowingly when he casts a spell, it uh, interacts with seven individuals. He's like, seven? It's never, uh, it's never uh, attached to seven, you know? And then it shows what these seven people had been doing immediately uh, before they had been uh, chosen, and some of them were uh, gangsters, and some of them were in prison, some of them were well, they were all different type of people, you know. And it shows everything they were doing. And then it shows a big, nice two-page spread uh, with, like, they show, like, the last thing they were saying on the previous page. And then it shows a big big two-page spread with, like, the last word of what they were saying as they have been warped to this new world. And then they all are pretty much in the same geographical area. And they're all like, hey, who are you? I don't know who you are. And then they see all these monsters coming from outside the castle, in towards the castle. So they're herded into the castle, they come inside, and then there's uh, there's uh, 
this guy in there. Get his name real fast. Haman, he calls himself Haman Kulis. Uh, he's like, he's like mysterious man in a red cloak. He's like, hey, you guys all made it. You're the new, uh, you're the new, uh, you know, pupil, students, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically uh, train you here. Uh, and so most of them are like, okay, with this. So he's like, first thing you gotta do is follow me up these stairs. So they're all uh, following him up these stairs that turn into like, Escher stairs, they're going everywhere, up, down, sideways, upside down. So they all navigate and they all make it to the top. And then he's like, all right, they're all made it to the top. I didn't think you'd all make it here. And then the guy who's a gangster is like, oh, well, I don't want to be some guy. Uh, why don't I just take my gun out and blow your head off? He's like, you don't have your gun anymore. And he's like, he's like, well, gun is better than some stupid wand. And Hamilton is like, uh, uh, you think you're going to be waving a wand like in... Like in literature, no, no. Being a magician's way cooler than that. And the guy's like, nothing's cooler than the gun. So then huh, he's like, I'm gonna kill you. He's like, you know, Hamakula's not gonna die, not not yet. And he's going to die, but not yet. And then all of a sudden, the guy who's uh, the gangster starts coughing up bullets, and like uh, he's healing over there, like, hey, hey, he's he's dying. He's coughing up bullets. And then the last page, he's just like spitting up blood and like a ton of bullets all over his face. And then we have Green Lantern number one, Dawn of DC by Jeremy Adams and Zermonico with a backup story by Philip Kennedy Johnson and Montos. The main story is your main, basically reintroduction to Hal Jordan. Uh, I'm not sure when, but the Guardians of Oa have disappeared and the uh, Green Lanterns are now being uh, uh, led and ruled by the Universal Federation of Planets, and because uh, basically the lanterns who come from Sector Twenty Eight Fourteen, uh, all of all of uh, all of the crazy stuff obviously has been going on uh, there in Twenty Eight Fourteen, like Dark Side invasions, uh, you know, every DC event, uh, every crisis is, is is centrally located around Earth in Twenty Eight Fourteen. So they said. Uh, screw those lanterns. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna patrol twenty eight fourteen anymore. We're gonna send those lanterns to other uh, sectors, and so Hal Jordan and uh, Hal Jordan and uh, John John Stewart. Hal Hal Jordan and John Stewart both say, "Well, f that. We'll just go back to Earth. Keep your ring." So this has them resettling on Earth, and. Then Hal interacts with a man who has a uh, old version of a Manhunter uh, costume that he found buried somewhere on Earth. And then while he's fighting him, uh, all of the green energy from the Manhunter suit uh, goes into him. And then he's like, who are you? And he's holding the ring. He's like, take a wild guess. Because Hal has more will. He's able to access the uh, green power of the ring. So now he has a ring, but... Uh, we, it remains to be seen how he's going to uh, charge the ring. He doesn't have the la uh, lantern anymore or access to that. And the backup story has uh, John Stewart arriving at his mother's house going, uh, I'm back. Uh, she's like, you've been gone for so long. He's like, yeah. He's like, I thought I'd rebuild this uh, gazebo out back that I used to stay in. It got destroyed, but I'm going to build it and live in there again. And she's, she's like, she's like, oh, you're just going to fly off into space. And he's like, no, I'm home for good now. I don't see anything to get, get me back out. And then it show flashes to space where uh, Guy Gardner is being attacked by, I don't know, let's see what it's called. He's being attacked by an old Green Lantern villain, The Revenant. What else is here? Who is it? The Radiant Dead. They're being attacked by the Radiant Dead. It's Guy Gardner and... Shepard. The other Greenlander's name is Shepard. So they're being attacked by these Revenant Dead. And uh, Guy Gardner is like, No, uh, the Revenant Dead, and they were defeated by Jon Stewart a long time ago. It can't be them. And then... Uh, 
Shepard is uh, defeated uh, in short order uh, by a new force that shows up and she, uh, she appears and she says, I am the Revenant Queen, uh, but I don't want uh, these two lanterns. I want uh, I want the, the tyrant who destroyed us. Where is Jon Stewart? So that's how that ends. So, so the Hal Jordan story is um, a full-length issue, and the Jon Stewart was about eight or nine pages, so it'll be interesting to see how they share the book from here on out. And here is the last book, your number one, Ghost Lore. Uh, loved it. Uh, impeccable, excellent art by uh, Leo Max, uh, written by Colin Bunn. Uh, basically, uh, takes place uh, at a small town church in the middle of a service uh, where the uh, the reverend says uh, basically uh, my mother always used to say this uh, about faith so da 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 and so it ends and then his wife comes in and goes like oh why would you lie to the uh, congregation like that my mother never had those type of feelings and he's like He's like, what does it matter? Uh, we're losing, we're losing members hand over fist, you know, and and so they argue for a little bit, and then they you find out that their teenage daughter uh, is not really speaking to them, and that uh, their son uh, something happened to him recently, and he has had trauma, and he has been mute, mute for a little while, so uh, they're driving home in the car, and uh, uh, the father's like. Tells his teenage daughter, uh, you're about to get your permit. Why don't you drive us home? You need to practice. And she's like, really? So they're driving home. And then uh, you find out while she's driving that she has the ability to see and hear ghosts. And she sees some uh, in the road and it frightens her. Uh, and she uh, unfortunately uh, drives off the road and plows into uh, a tree, which is like normal uh, horror movie cliche that happens in a lot of horror movies. And then uh, it cuts back to them waking up in the car, and she wakes up first, and her uh, father is in the seat next to her, and he is trapped in a seatbelt, and he has a head injury, and he's like all delirious, and he's like, what's going on, what's going on? Is everyone safe? And then all of a sudden, the son from the back is like, I'm ready to speak to you now. And like, he's like, oh, oh my God. Now you choose this time to speak with. I'm so happy to hear your voice. You know, he's like, He's like incredulous about it. And then the son's like, no, I need you to be quiet and listen to me. I have to tell you this. Uh, this is why I haven't been speaking. And he goes into this whole story about how him and his friends, uh, the last time they were all at church together, uh, there was uh, a new family in from out of town and there was like a new little girl who moved in as a daughter with them. And she was kind of like sort of goth and sort of different from a, uh, this small town type of boy, you know, so they decide uh, they're gonna just pick on her because she's different. So they follow her out of the uh, service and throw rocks and such at her uh, until she runs into the forest uh, crying and then like they're chasing after her and when they get deep into the forest, she turns into a big monster and starts eating three of the boys. And then this uh, boy in the car, he, he survived it and ran away and uh, so he's like, so, 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 that, so that's my dark secret. I, sh I should have just left her alone. She just wanted to, uh, she just wanted to, you know, be undercover as a person in our town and have a normal life. She didn't want to be a monster anymore because both her and her parents were one giant monster organism. Uh, so the parents, parents were just never seen at home and she was shuttled to school, uh, because before this church service, she's been known at school, uh, but she's also the monster, but she can transform into this girl. So, but because the boys were mean and threw rocks at her and uh, blew up the, uh, whatever you call it, her disguise, now she's, screw now she's screwed and the monster now has to leave town because she's like, but she tells the boy, I don't ever want you to speak a word of this to anybody. So that like he's become mute. And so the girl's like, Okay, why are you telling us all now? And she turns around and you see the boy is dead. And his ghost has been telling her all this. And he's like, Because I know that you can hear our last words 
And the father's like, what, what, what's going on? You know, and then she jumps out of the car and he's still trapped inside and he's like, no, don't leave me here. And then all these other ghosts are surrounding them and they're all like, we have something to tell you and we have something to tell you. We all have something we need to get off our chest. And it kind of ends there. So very cool idea for a story. The only thing I was kind of uh, off about was like, it's all about these ghosts. This is a really cool uh, spot UV. Uh, it's cool. Let me get it out of the bag. You can see the ghosts a little better. I didn't really look at this until I had it out and was reading it. But a uh, very cool uh, variant cover. As you can see all like the ghosts appearing on the spot UV on the cover. Very cool. But yeah, if this is going to be a uh, the thing about hauntings and ghosts being able to have their last say with the living. Uh, what the hell was the, what the hell did the monster uh, aspect of it have to do with anything? That just seemed out of, out of left field there. All right, those are the books. Here is uh, this week's books. This is this week's books. This Wednesday's book from the uh, 17th. Probably one of the earliest times I've ever received my, uh, this is one of the earliest times I've ever received my weekly books. I usually get them a full week after, uh, a full week after release date, but this time it's kind of cool. So, and here is, uh, here's the ones I didn't get to last week, so I will, I will review my, my favorites out of these ones. I did read Invincible Iron Man, but I didn't want to really go too far into it. It's a flashback story. And it doesn't really uh, tie much into what's been going on with the Stark Sentinels. So. But it's pretty good. That's just the main flashback story to back in the 80s when he was with the West Coast Avengers. All right, here is our... Uh, Invoice. We have 27 items this week. I do believe I have a lot of uh, multiple variants this week, so that, that explains a lot of them. Drop the knife. I must have dropped a knife. I don't see it anymore. up we have house of slaughter issue 15 this is the finale to the butcher's return uh by james tanyan and tate bromble with art by antonio fuso and uh designed by werther del Redra. this is cover i believe this is cover b by del Redra. yep cover b by werther del Redra. Next up is new number one, The Vigil number one, uh, by Ram V and Lalit Kumar Sharma. Uh, main cover by Sumit Kumar from uh, Ram V's, uh, what was that miniseries called? This vampire miniseries at, at Vault. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. I'll remember it one of these times. Next up, we have Hulk Annual Number One. This is by David Propose uh, and Mejado, and has a preview of the new Incredible Hulk series coming up by Philip Kennedy Johnson with art by Travel Foreman. This is cover A by Gary Frank. Awesome. Next up, Dawn of DC Titans Number One uh, by Tom Taylor with art by Nicola Scott. I have these covers by Bruno. Nope, covers by Nicola Scott. Here is Batman Superman World's Finest number 15 by the dream team of Mark Wade, Dan Mora, and Tamara Bond villain. Excellent. One of the best series at DC. 
Here is long-awaited new number one for the Avengers coming to you from uh, new writer Jed McKay. Uh, I'm blanking on the artist right now, but this is cover B by K.L. New, who is the uh, main cover artist on Iron Man. Next up, here is Red Room Crypto Killers. Issue number one, Ed Piscor at Fenty Graphics. It's interesting that they show uh, this character on the cover, but he was shot and murdered at the end of volume two. So we'll see if that has to do with things. Next up, we have House of Slaughter, uh, number 15. This is the connecting cardstock variant by Danny Luckert. Uh, and I did receive in the last box my issue 13 connecting uh, cardstock. So uh, probably on Instagram, I will uh, uh, get them all put together and show it off as uh, it's connecting set. Pretty cool. And the second one. third one. Next up, here's Gunslinger, issue number 20 by Todd McFarlane and Brett Booth. This is cover A by oh, what is this guy's name? He's the Capullo poem guy. Victor. Victor, Bond, Victor Bogdanovich. Uh, yeah. When I first saw Victor Bogdanovich's art on a Wolverine issue, I'm like, this is very similar to Kabul, Greg Capullo. <laughs> Next up, here is a good new number one. Here's Batman, The Brave and the Bold, issue number one. Uh, I believe this has a new uh, Batman versus Joker origin type of first, first or second meeting type of story from Tom King and Mitch Gerrids. As Superman by Christopher Cantwell. Uh, and uh, a Batman black and white. A uh, mini story by uh, written and drawn by the great Dan Mora. So, a lot of cool stuff in there. And uh, the Tom uh, King Joker story is three issues. And then uh, I saw solicit for issue four. Done with it. That's the good thing about uh, what do you call those uh, books like these? These these six to eight dollar uh, anthologies. Once uh, the good creators go, you can just follow them out. Here is uh, my second of a uh, copy of the uh, cover B by Werther de la Rada of uh, House of Slaughter 15. And there's my third. Usually they have them all together. I'm assuming how I opened and put them together there. Here is uh, The Return of Dark Spaces. Scott Snyder's Dark Spaces. This is uh, Volume 2, Good Deeds. This is written by uh, Che Grayson with art by Kelsey Ramsey. And this is, uh, I believe, cover A by uh, Hayden Sherman. Yes. No, this is cover C by Hayden Sherman. Cover C by Hayden Sherman, who uh, was the main artist on Good Deeds. I mean, not uh, on uh, Dark Spaces Wildfire. So very cool there. Next up, we have The Return of Earth Divers. This is the beginning of a three-part story entitled Ice Age. And this is uh, continued to be written by Stephen Graham Jones. And this three-part story will be uh, illustrated by Ricardo Bercielli, who uh, I believe did uh, the DMZ series at Vertigo a long time ago. Next up, here's a new uh, Jonathan Hedrick book. Uh, this was uh, kickstarted uh, long ago and it has been picked up by Advent Comics. So this is issue number one uh, from Jonathan Hedrick with art by Gino. Uh, so this is, uh, I believe it's uh, handy capable people who are uh, bestowed with superpowers. I believe that's what the aspect of this is. I'm interested to see that. I've gone deep into the uh, Jonathan Hedrick book since uh, Dream Master came out and I joined uh, Jonathan's Substack. Uh, very interesting creator. Fun, fun guy. Here is Star Wars High Republic Adventures The Nameless Terror the finale. And also last issue uh, we found out that these uh, 
these guys have inside the ship are actually uh, eggs. Eggs for the leveler. They're leveler eggs. And that is why the leveler is trying to uh, break into the ship. I mean, outside of they like to eat Jedi, of course. These are not being controlled like in the Marvel series. Uh, these are... Uh, they're fighting to get their uh, eggs, which at the end of issue three, uh, I started the hatch. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this uh, uh, series ends. That's uh, from Dark Horse Comics. And a second copy. Next up, we have, ooh, nice, The Return of Ice Cream Man uh, 35. Issue number 35, cover A by Martin Marazzo. Uh, w. Maxwell Prince with Martin Marazzo. Necessary Monsters. Definitely. Definitely. Here is No One, issue number three, from uh, Kyle Higgins and Brian Bucciolato on writing and art by Jorge Borges. Uh, really cool into this one. I still have to... Uh, Carve out some time to check out one of the uh, podcasts that goes along with this. See how it uh, intermingles. Next up, House of Slaughter, issue number 15. This is cover A by Mateus Mahanini. Final part of The Butcher's Return. Get a couple more. And also, I saw the boom solicits for... Uh, August, House of Slaughter, arc number four, will uh, be a spotlight on the White Masks, who you meet in this storyline, and also a new Rom V series will uh, be kicked off with a uh, ash can in August. New Rom with uh, Felipe Andrade, uh, the team of uh, Many Deaths of Layla Star. And speaking of Many Deaths of Layla Star, uh, the uh, pen and ink... Uh, series of uh, reissue number ones. Uh, Many Deaths of Light of Star number one is the second issue of that after something is killing the children this month. Here is uh, The Mighty Barbarians, issue number two from Michael Marisi and Kafaro. Let's see here, got the art on this bad boy. This is cover A. That's probably just a Carafo uh, art. And close to the end here is Miles Morales Spider-Man issue number six. This is part two of Carnage Reigns. This is the connecting uh, cover variant by uh, Torin Clark. That's cool. And there's Iron Man. We haven't seen him uh, appear yet in the storyline yet, but he must be appearing soon. And finally... Here we have Venom, issue number 19. This is the Philip Tan variant, uh, solicited as a Ryan Stegman, the Ryan Stegman, the other variant. That's how I bought it, but I'm pretty, I'm glad it did turn out to be this cover. Uh, since it wasn't actually a Ryan Stegman variant, this is pretty, from the ones I did see, this is definitely the coolest looking one. Although, uh, I think Norman's in here, but Odd to have gold oven on the cover. All right, really looking forward to uh, finishing off this video by breaking into uh, my Kickstartered Sink Cutthroat issue number one. So yeah, I, I backed the Kickstarter. Uh, I got myself a physical copy. I got myself this T-shirt. Uh, they said they didn't make enough money to unlock the uh, to unlock the bookmark. At the end of the day, they did actually uh, achieve that. Uh... Oh, we got... Oh, I forgot. That's why it's so heavy. I mean, why is it so heavy? I did end up getting a second book. Uh... Whew, this is a this is a beefy. So. Oh. Okay. I take it back. I take it back. Very cool. This is a... Uh... Sink Cutthroat, issue number one. Another thing that was unlocked during the Kickstarter. 
uh, for backers was uh, the uh, red foil upgrade to the A cover of St. Cutthroat. This is uh, cover A by Alex Cormack. This is by the uh, incomparable John Lees with Alex Cormack and Sean Lee on the letters. Uh, and then it came with, uh, looks like two uh, metal trading cards. And there's the bookmark. Actually, I don't know if that was from Dig or, or is there supposed to be a cutthroat related bookmark, but I'm happy to get a bookmark since it did meet that threshold. And then I also got myself a copy of the uh, Dig a Sink Tail number one uh, variant. See, we got the name of the artist on the back here. Oh, it's hard to get in the comics today. Oh, there it is. Very cool. This is limited edition cover. Cover G by Greg Kirkpatrick. I remember seeing this, uh, this didn't make the actual dig, uh, Kickstarter. I didn't, I didn't back dig. Probably, I probably should have. Uh, but this, uh, was added at the end of, I believe at the end of the Kickstarter, and it was also available on Comics Tribe, uh, on their web store. But then this was, uh, an add-on at the end of, uh, the Kickstarter, so. I do have, uh, the, uh, open to order uh, issue uh, that I got from what would you call it? Uh, ooh, sticky in the back. Hmm. I may reread this. The one, thing I have, the one thing I have to say about Dig is when I read it, it seemed like some of the pages might have been out of order because they show him go off to have a ba battle with the main villain towards the end. And then they show him having the battle. And then they show his family at home and him recuperating from the battle. And then him again, like like something that might happen before or during the battle. So it's kind of weirdly, weirdly uh, non-linearly told in the uh, issue. So I'm going to see if maybe the pages got put out of order in the open order issue and I'll bring this with me when I bring my comics to read at work on breaks and uh, I'll reread Dig. So that is awesome. Thank you Comic Stribe and thank you Kickstarter for um, supporting uh, John and Alex's uh, passion project. Uh, had I uh, known of uh, these creators in this series, uh, Earlier, I would have probably uh, been on a earlier St. Kickstarter. I remember John Lee's Hotel was one of the uh, three comics that brought me back into the hobby. Uh, so, yeah. Very cool. Looking forward to it. I did uh, a skim read, uh, Cutthroat, and the PDF that was uh, delivered immediately at the end of uh, the uh, campaign. But uh, I'm a physical man, so I will give it a full, uh, give it a full uh, read, read, reread, full read, fully full read. All right. So yeah, two videos in a week. Uh, who would have thunk it? Anyway, everybody take care out there in the community. Uh, the, uh, my next box is uh, slated as uh, preparing for shipment. So uh, we'll see if I can get it to me as quickly as this box. I'll have another video for you uh, uh, next week. If not, it'll be uh, it'll be a skip week for videos, and I'll see you guys uh, early and uh, early in June. So, all right, see you next time. Take care, everybody.